Good morning, everybody. Well, we're in Luke 5, so turn in your Bibles. Today we're going to uh, begin our study uh, with verse 27, and we're going to finish the chapter. When studying the scriptures, there exist some acknowledged rules of interpretation that help us. Uh, they apply in varying ways according to the portions of scripture that are before us. In our study of the book of Proverbs, Mike has pointed out some of those uh, rules of interpretation that apply to uh, wisdom books like uh, the Proverbs. And the Gospels uh, have their own rules, call for their own rules. And I want to begin by identifying one of them at the start this morning before we read these 13 verses that close the chapter. And it is that we ought to concern ourselves with where the gospel writer has been and where he is going. In other words, how does our passage fit into the overall flow of the book? You already know that each gospel writer in telling the story of Jesus' life and death and resurrection uh, naturally uh, tended toward uh, certain emphases. Uh, but we also know that within each gospel, uh, there is a uh, movement, there are movements uh, that we find guiding us from one scene to another. And here in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Jesus has been presented, if you reflect back on what we've studied so far, uh, he has been presented teaching and healing. Uh, he healed Simon's mother-in-law, he cast out demons, he healed a leper, he healed a paralytic, and most significantly, he pronounced uh, the paralytic's sins uh, forgiven, the greatest healing that one could receive. Well, in today's verses, Luke puts before us a collage of activities and teaching uh, that beg to be understood uh, together and yet challenge us to discover why. It begins with the call by Jesus of the tax collector Levi, who we also know as Matthew, to be his follower. Uh, that was a big deal, and we're tempted to define our verses by that simple act, as the editors of my Bible did, the call of Levi. And yet, when we reach the end, we find Jesus putting forth twin parables of patching new cloth on an old garment and pouring new wine into old wineskins, and in between, uh, is a discussion about fasting. So what I, I want to suggest this morning is that the verses taken as a unit, above all, speak to us about the joy Jesus brings into the lives of sinners. It is a new joyfulness he has brought that binds these verses together. I think you'll see that as we read them. So let's read now our passage beginning in verse uh, 27. After that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, well, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. Uh, those of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come, and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts 
new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new, for he says the old is good enough. It will not be until chapter 6 that Jesus officially commissions his 12 disciples, but this is not the first time that those disciples are described, as in our passage today, as leaving everything behind and following after the Lord. Simon and Andrew and James and John, after the miraculous catch of fish, remember, did the same thing. But Levi's decision, if you think about it, is the one that Luke couches in terms of the great joy that he felt, uh, hosting a big reception for the Lord in his house, accompanied by joyful feasting and, and drinking. Among other consequences of choosing to follow after Jesus, it seems that sheer joy is, is a dominant one. When we study the Beatitudes, as we have uh, in the past, uh, we're always careful to distinguish between the blessed state of those that Jesus described there. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. We're, we're always careful to distinguish between that blessedness and simple happiness. And likewise, when we attempt to describe what joy is, we refuse to identify it with mere uh, happiness. The dictionary uh, defines joy as the emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. It's something greatly valued or appreciated. In the Bible, joy is a quality, uh, not simply an emotion grounded upon God himself and indeed derived uh, from him. It, it is something that should characterize the Christian's life on earth. Jesus himself, the Bible teaches, is our joy. Uh, therefore, joy is not limited or, or tied to the exter external things that, that happen to us, and they are many and, and varied. Spurgeon said, it's an unfortunate thing for the Christian to become melancholy. If there is any person in the world that has a right to have a bright, clear face and flashing eye, it is the one whose sins are forgiven him and who is saved with God's salvation. And so in the verses before us, I would represent to you joy is the, the dominant theme. Let's see if I can prove that. Well, Luke introduces the section by describing Jesus' apprehension of a tax collector named Levi. Like Peter, we know Levi by two names. Uh, perhaps they both obtained the second name, the names by which we know them best in the same way. Jesus gave them to him. Simon became Peter, which is derived from a word that means rock. And Levi became Matthew, which means gift of God. Uh, that's conjecture, but both Mark and Luke introduce him as Levi, and Matthew himself, uh, in his own gospel, refers to himself only as Matthew. Well, we know little about him, don't we? I mean, it, Matthew is the book of the Bible. He was one of the, the 12 disciples. Uh, except for what we learn in his calling by Jesus to be his follower. He was a sinner. Uh, that's what we're all no, known as. Uh, what do you know about that person? Well, she's a sinner. That's what we know about her. Uh, but he was a sinner, and he was a particularly notorious uh, kind of sinner. He was a tax collector. Uh, we like to say that there are only two things certain in life, death and taxes. And Levi's introduction into the gospel is a testimony to the fact that that was true in Jesus' time as well, both the Jews in their day and ours generally bear a grudge against tax collectors. Uh, they take our money, and uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, we don't like it when someone takes our hard-earned money. But living under Roman rule, the people were subject to Roman taxes 
and hope this isn't tedious, but there were two general categories of Roman taxes, direct taxes, such as the poll tax and income taxes, and indirect taxes, which consisted of tolls on roads and bridges, on uh, sales taxes, custom taxes, that sort of thing. Well, the direct taxes, the Roman authorities collected themselves, but the indirect taxes, they farmed out uh, to local collectors. In today's vernacular, we'd say they outsourced uh, that, that business. And the practice was to assign to these uh, gatherers a, a fixed amount tax quota to collect, but allow them to keep for themselves however much they collected above that amount. Makes uh, enough sense. Uh, but as you would suspect, it was a system tailor-made for uh, corruption and abuse, and one that attracted the most larcenous characters with little regard for the, legitis the legitimacy of the claims they, they made. And consequently, tax collectors uh, made themselves rich uh, by cheating their fellow citizens. The Talmud uh, classified them as robbers. And they were easily, tax collectors were easily the most hated people in Hebrew society. Uh, classed in various places in the Gospels with extortioners and adulterers and pagan Gentiles. So when a Jewish man entered into that profession, he essentially left the fellowship of his community. He was no longer welcome uh, among his fellow uh, Jews, and he became an outcast. According to one of the best commentators on the account, William Lane, he would have become disqualified as a judge or a, as a witness in a court session, and he was uh, summarily excommunicated from the synagogue. Lumped together in a category known simply as sinners, uh, they were the lowest of the low. Uh, so when we read in verse 27 that Jesus noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in his tax booth, we are to understand that he was looking upon a person despised by everybody. Uh, that makes it at least surprising to read, as Luke describes it, that when Jesus said to him, follow me, he immediately got up and, and followed him. But we must not think that Levi had not known uh, Jesus before. Uh, Le Levi lived and, and practiced his trade in the same region uh, where uh, Jesus uh, spent a lot of time, where Jesus had been living. It's actually likely that they may have had some acquaintance with each other. Jesus knew who Levi was. Levi knew who Jesus uh, was. And that made it all the more amazing, I would imagine, to Levi, for him to hear Jesus say to him, follow me. Well, the text reads here in verse 27 that Jesus uh, noticed Levi. And we should especially mark that. Jesus noticed him. He, he chose that verb, uh, Luke did, intentionally because it's stronger uh, than merely seeing someone as I'm seeing you now and you're seeing each other. Uh, it's stronger than that. It conveys the kind of intentional look that has purpose. Uh, it also often implies joy at beholding, he saw Levi, and there was a joy in Jesus' heart at seeing him there. Like you and me, Jesus saw all kinds of things and all, all kinds of people, but in this case, he's, he saw more, and he rejoiced uh, to see. Jesus' eyes uh, were always peeled, we might say, looking and seeing in others what no one else could see, and when he saw Matthew, he saw the sinner, but he also saw beyond his sin to what he would accomplish in him. Uh, he saw in Matthew a man within whom he would plant an ability to see him. Well, there's a sense then in which Jesus' seeing is discriminating. 
Uh, no one escapes his notice, and yet many become the object of this kind of purposeful attention from him. Near the end of his earthly ministry, think back with me or forward with me uh, to John chapter 17 in Jesus' high priestly prayer. You remember this, Jesus told the Father, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of uh, the world. I've manifested your name to them. And then later he says, I don't ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who will believe in me through their word. And so every individual who has been or will be apprehended by the Lord in this special way was on the Lord's heart that night. Everyone, all the sheep, every member of the church was on the Lord's heart uh, that night. And it's undeniably uh, true that Jesus Christ has noticed in that special way each one uh, rejoicing over each one. The author of Hebrews uh, wrote in chapter 12 that Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Now there would be much that would contribute to that joy that uh, caused him to endure the cross, but surely part of it was the granting of God's desire that each and every one who had caught his eye in this way would be irreversibly claimed by him for himself. But the apostle, I put it this way in Ephesians 1 verse 3, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. So here is God's loving choice of us in living color. I think we can say when Luke says that Jesus saw Levi, here is his loving election of Levi in living color. This was Levi's day. This was Matthew's day. Matthew was a great sinner, but Jesus had seen him and the blessings would be his for Jesus had the power not only to cast out demons and, and heal the sick, uh, but also to bring about a radical and permanent change in the mind, heart, will, and life of the very worst sinner. Praise the Lord. Drawn by the Savior's eye, his heart suddenly transformed by God's loving election of him, Levi left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. He was a wealthy man. He had cheated his way uh, to great riches, uh, but he turned his back on earthly treasure and he made the decisive break. Peter and the others, uh, fishermen by trade, they'd done the same thing, but they could have always fallen back to their occupation if things had not worked out with, with Jesus. But when Matthew abandoned his post, uh, this departure was final. He forfeited his position. He could never go back, and he went in a completely different direction. But there was no sadness in Levi's decision, far from it. Instead of feeling sorry at leaving his well-paying business and acting as though he was making some kind of sacrifice for Jesus, Levi felt the opposite way. He, he celebrated it. Uh, Luke writes that he gave a big reception for him in his house and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at table uh, with them. Uh, the reception was in honor of Jesus. Uh, Levi's focus was on him, but it was also because he considered the change in his own life as a reason for celebration and, and rejoicing. Uh, that's the function of most banquets, uh, to have what amounts to a party in order to publicly and actively acknowledge there's something to rejoice about. 
And Levi, no doubt, had the means to do it up big. They were eating and they were drinking, and Levi had Jesus there as the guest of honor so that his friends could uh, recognize that and, and meet him uh, there. That was the other reason for, for throwing this party. He was excited, and he wanted for his friends the same opportunity to meet Jesus and to know and follow him as he had. As Bishop Raul observed, a converted person will not wish to go to heaven alone. That's a kind of pattern in, in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus calls people to himself and they rush and tell others. Andrew went and found uh, Simon. Philip found Nathaniel. An angel appears to Cornelius in, in, in Acts chapter 10, telling him that God had heard his prayer and for him to go and call Peter uh, to come and, and give him a message. And when Peter arrives, lo and behold, what do you find? Cornelius. Now, this is from Acts chapter 10. He called together his relatives and close friends so that Peter arrives to this great crowd of, of people who, uh, according to uh, uh, Acts chapter 10, they're all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. He called them all. Peter's coming to tell us this important message. Well, in the same way here, uh, Matthew can't wait to get his friends, they're of the same ilk as, as he was. He hung out with his own uh, crowd. Uh, he can't wait uh, to get his friends together to hear and see and know the same person that, that he has come to know. He wants them to know Jesus as he now knows him. And, and not surprisingly, Jesus is, is a willing uh, participant. There's no indication that he was somehow hoodwinked into, into coming to this banquet. So here is a gathering of Jesus and his disciples along with a houseful of what we might justifiably call reprobates and they're having a meal together. And that's when Luke informs us in verse 30 that somehow the Pharisees and their scribes found out about their social gathering and they began grumbling at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? The scribes were the expert interpreters of the law, and they were the ones who had conceived of these various restrictions on mixed relations between the Jews and everyone else whose behavior, is, whose behavior identified them as living outside their traditions. Uh, they and their followers uh, were in their, eye, in their eyes, quote, the righteous. They were the righteous, and all the others were, were, were sinners. They were the righteous. The, other, the others were sinners. So this distorted outlook was twofold. First, that they themselves could in any way be considered righteous. Uh, the parallel account in Matthew 9 records an extra line from Jesus. He said, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Their own mercilessness uh, was a sign of their unregenerate uh, hearts. They were themselves, in fact, the sinners. Uh, their really, 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 I made this word up myself. Their religiosity, that's my word, their religiosity had stolen from them their faith. That happens to people, doesn't it? The second distortion flowed naturally from the first. It was the iron wall they had erected between themselves and, and any others. And out of that distinction came those various laws and restrictions preventing a Jew from even eating with a Gentile or entering his home. But Jesus rejected their interpretation of and their additions to the law. He was always doing that. And, and now this tradition of theirs that restricted their intermingling with sinners, he dismisses with the use of what was most probably a well-known proverb at the time there in verse 31. It's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. We've got a lot of sickness going around today, but those that are well typically don't go to the doctor. It's those who are sick. Well, and the saying expressed a conviction that Jesus championed uh, more than once, that there are only two types of people in the world. Sinners 
who think themselves righteous and sinners who acknowledge their sin. The one is sick but thinks himself healthy and so finds no need for a physician. The other is sick and comes to feel it in the very fiber of his soul. Blessed are the poor in spirit is how the Beatitudes uh, began. Uh, they are the people who are blessed because they understand their own poverty of spirit and their own need. Uh, they are the ones who mourn over their sin. The reality is the whole of them uh, were sick, but Jesus chose to mingle with the sick ones who knew they were sick. He was with the sinners. And the reason for that, you might ask, why? It's because he loves uh, sinners. Praise the Lord, Jesus loves sinners. He is the friend of sinners and the whole point of his life, the meaning of the incarnation revolved around sinners uh, for those who were sick with the disease of sin. He loved them, not because he was a sinner too, he wasn't sick, on the contrary, he was the physician, but his love for them originated out of that same discriminating grace that characterized his seeing and his calling of them. Uh, they were to be found everywhere. They were the sheep that the Father had given to him, of whom he declared he would not lose one of them. And, and he sought to be among them uh, so that he might heal them and give them life. That's where he wanted to be. Jesus knew who he was. He was the physician. And the place for the physician was among the sick, the sinners because sin is a fatal disease that leads to death. And the Lord spent a great deal of time among sinners. That's apparent as you read through the, uh, the Gospels. And when he departed from this earth, he left his followers to be his representatives, to extend his healing power to sinful men and women through the power of his spirit. He said, you go now and, and make disciples as, as I have done. Isn't it strange then how unlike him I am? Don't want to make you feel guilty. Uh, how unlike him we are. Uh, most Christians uh, spend almost all of our time around the healthy and not uh, the sick. We have Christian friends and we engage in social activities with other Christians. We marry and we have children and then we do everything in our power to keep our children away from those uh, who aren't Christians. Kit Hughes observed, we're virtually pharisaical Christians. We play tennis with Christians and eat dinner with Christians. We have Christian doctors, Christian dentists, Christian plumbers, Christian veterinarians. Even our dogs are Christian, <laughs> right? We end up, in fact, very much like the Pharisees who forbade mixing with non-Jews because we, in effect, erect a fence between ourselves and the world of unbelievers. Now, I'd like to think that's not true, but experience, my own experience keeps telling me that it is, and I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad. I really see myself in this. When someone asks you, like they have me, to bring an unbelieving friend to an evangelistic lunch or, or dinner, and you can't think of one to bring? Isn't it true? You're not getting to know them. I like being with believers, that's my preference. I, I like being with you. Uh, but is that our calling strictly? It's difficult, I admit, to be in the world, but not of it. But many of us are trying desperately to not even be in it. Jesus loves sinners, and he made it a priority, he did, to be among them because they were his mission field. He had come to seek and save that which was lost, to give healing to the unhealthy, and not to hobnob with religious bigots who had lost any true consciousness of their own sinfulness and need for healing. So enough of, of that. 
because now in verse 33, this same group has a, a second related but different criticism of Jesus. I'm being flippant here, but it's that he and his disciples were having so much fun. <laughs> they didn't like that. They said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And they mentioned two spiritual disciplines here, so what they do, that concern them on account of them missing in the behavior of Jesus and his disciples. Let's consider the second one first, prayers. Of course, Jesus was a prolific a prayer. Uh, we know that. He was always praying. And he, was, and he taught his disciples to pray. So we can only imagine that his disciples were great prayers uh, also, or at least they were working at it. So probably what they had in mind here were these liturgical type prayers that they had invented, uh, that they had made incumbent upon anyone who aspired to their man-made righteousness. Uh, that's, that's the kind of practice that infects every uh, form of false religion. And so the Lord declined even to respond to that, at least as far as we can tell. And fasting. Fasting was not uncommon in first century Judaism, though the Old Testament explicitly called for only one uh, required fast, that was on the Day of Atonement. But the Pharisees had developed a habit of fasting twice weekly on Mondays and Thursdays. So that was probably what they had in mind. We're doing this, uh, John's disciples are fasting, so they were fasting. Uh, that was probably because of the ascetic uh, practices of John the Baptist. John the Baptist had come to prepare the way for the Messiah. He called for repentance, and repentance often uh, involved, when done properly, uh, fasting. So uh, it was true that his disciples were not habitually fasting, so the Lord uh, chose to answer that accusation, and as he often would, uh, he did so by using an illustration, comparing his and his disciples' behavior to the atmosphere during a wedding feast. So here's verse 34, Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? It just so happens that Cindy and I went to a wedding feast night before last, uh, New Year's Eve. It was quite the ornate, affair. We saw some of your friends uh, there, and uh, there was lots of dancing and eating and drinking, and the focus of the wedding celebration, naturally, was the bride and, and the groom. Uh, they were there in, in the center, waiting for the equivalent of, of Dan to, to meet with them and do the vows. And, and then at the reception, they were introduced, and they did the first dance. The focus of the celebration was on the groom and the bride. But when they left, it was over. Uh, the party was over. At least we believe they left. There was no way we were staying to the end <laughs> to see whether they left or not. But Jewish weddings in Jesus' day were drawn out affairs, the, the festivities lasting for several days. And what Jesus is saying is that just as it would be inappropriate for the wedding guests to fast during that week-long time of celebration, so it likewise would be for Jesus' disciples to fast while he was there. His presence among them, his arrival on the scene was an important event, and it called not for fasting, but for rejoicing. There would be a time after he was gone for them to, to fast. And that was the point uh, I was trying to make last Sunday as we prepared uh, for the Lord's Supper. There, there would indeed be a time coming when his followers would fast. He goes on to say, look there in verse 35, the days will come and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. So there's a double meaning here. I like things with double meanings. There's the obvious one. In the midst of a wedding celebration, the, the attendants don't fast, 
But when the bridegroom departs to take up his married life, well, then the attendants can pick back up with, with, with fasting and the like. But coming from the Lord, there's also this hidden uh, meaning in the phrase, when he is taken away, when he is taken away, because the phrase is an expression often used in the sense of a violent arrest and removal. And what the Lord intends by his illustration is that his earthly destiny is to be violently removed from them. Then, when that happens, they will fast. They will mourn, and the joy of his presence with them will be but a memory. And when we read the gospel accounts of Christ's crucifixion and death, we see that reaction in the hours following when his family and his followers were confused. Uh, they mourned and they were deeply grieved at what they perceived to be a great loss. But that was before they became aware of his resurrection and, and eventually of the fact that he was gonna be with them forever, uh, through, just like he is with us today through the Holy Spirit. After he appeared to them and explained fully what he had accomplished, their demeanor changed to one of great joy. And so in his treatment of these verses, I mentioned this last week, I, Howard Marshall, noted that in the early church that followed, there's really no evidence of a pattern of regular fasting. Individuals may have fasted for their own particular reasons, but the church as a body was not characterized by fasting. And Marshall wrote this, he said, all the indications are that the early church lived in a spirit of joy and experienced fellowship with the risen Lord as it celebrated the Lord's Supper, which we'll get to do today. So the key to understanding his wedding illustration is to recognize that he has in mind the wondrous joy that believers in him will possess as they fellowship with him and, and with each other in the glory of our salvation wrought by him through his suffering sacrifice on the cross. And now in the closing verses of the chapter, Jesus takes the opportunity to state a basic principle. These figures uh, patching old garments with new cloth and filling old wineskins with new wine have confounded many. They've confounded me. I remember what is he talking about here. But they simply represent Jesus' insistence that the mission he came to accomplish involved a radical break with the old religious practices of Judaism. You'll notice the emphasis in each parable is on the old and the new and how they simply do not pair well uh, together. Uh, first, you don't take a piece of cloth from a new garment and put it on an old garment. If you do that, you'll fail in two ways. Uh, you'll tear up what is a brand new garment, and those were valuable, especially back then. You'll tear up the the old garment, I mean the new garment, and the patch itself won't match on the old garment. And the point is Jesus is not simply patching up the old covenant, he is teaching something new. And to take only a portion of Jesus' message is to spoil the whole, the whole of it. Set secondly, in verse 37, you don't put new wine into old wineskins. That wine, that new wine hasn't fermented yet. And when it does ferment, it's going to swell and it will burst the old brittle skins and the wine will be spilt. New wine has to be put on into fresh wine skins that have some elasticity to them to expand as the wine swells. The point of both figures is that any attempt to combine the old with the new will lead to destructive loss. Uh, the Lord, Jesus, was inaugurating a new age, a new covenant, and to attempt to combine one 
within the other will deny the whole enterprise. Christ came that we might have life, he said, and have it abundantly. Like new wine in a new wine skin, Christ produces an expanding joy in the hearts of his own people. And you know, that is what our elderly saints who have been believers for years and years and years testify to, this expanding joy in their hearts as the Lord becomes more and more real and close to them. And that his enemies oppose him is not surprising. That's how the passage ends in verse 39. They don't want the new life. Christ promises uh, for them the old is enough. That's who was running uh, uh, the Jewish uh, people. The old is good enough. Well, here's the final thought. Uh, Christians should be joyful. In, in case you haven't gotten it already, cr Christians should be joyful uh, people. Uh, joy is a verifiable uh, gift of the Spirit. Uh, listed second in Galatians chapter five, five behind, behind only love. Every believer in Jesus Christ has been personally made the object of Jesus's joyful gaze. He rejoiced to lay eyes on us and bring us into the joy and glory that is his eternal disposition toward us. Amidst all the difficulties and the trials of this life, and they're never ending, uh, they're different day by day, year by year, but amidst them all, we must never forget to contemplate that. We belong to him. He purchased us for himself, and it's glorious. Uh, we should be joyful. It's said of George Whitfield, uh, that brilliant, uh, indefatigable evangelist in the 18th century, that beyond his natural gifts and his surpassing talent as an orator, and preacher, he was a man of singularly happy and cheerful spirit. No one saw Whitfield, uh, who saw Whitfield, could ever doubt that he enjoyed his faith. It, it made his ministry more effective. This story is told of a New Yorker who had been privileged to hear him. He traveled all over the place, and she had been converted. And she spoke about the influences by which the Spirit won her heart. To God, and she described the impression that Whitfield had made. She said, he was so cheerful that it tempted me to become a Christian. But let us all make that our aspiration. Let the new wine of his spirit uh, swell in our hearts uh, today, tomorrow, in the days ahead. I just turned that into a New Year's uh, lesson. Let me close in prayer. Father, how grateful we are that we are new people. Uh, you have made us new in Christ. Uh, you have filled us uh, with your love and joy and above all, uh, forgiven our sins uh, in the sacrifice of your own son. We praise you for him and ask, Lord, that uh, day by day your spirit uh, might uh, so enlarge our hearts and uh, cause joy to swell up in us more and more as we attempt to live this Christian life in this world where you have placed us. Thank you for the gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. May we be faithful proclaimers of it, uh, loving sinners as uh, our Lord loved them. We pray in his name. Amen.